Again, what a beautiful day Almighty God has given us. We rejoice in the opportunity that we have to be together these days, to pray and to reflect and to discern how we as individual disciples of the Lord and how we as God's church in this place, in this part of the world, might bring the good news, the joy of the gospel, as Pope Francis directs us to the people of our age in a more effective way. May God continue to watch over us these days, give us the Holy Spirit, and we ask the intercession of Mary, our mother. I ask you to rejoice with me today. 11 years ago today at the cathedral in Crookston, I was ordained a bishop. So it's my 11th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. God is good. It's quite a journey, but it's a blessing every day. This morning, as we reflect on our scriptures and as we begin these days, this time together, I'd like to present three things for your reflection. First of all, a picture, something to hold in your mind and heart, maybe these days, a picture of fascination, excitement, and joy. Secondly, a the fascination, excitement, and joy of Jesus and of discipleship. And thirdly, a little reflection on Jesus' own desire to gather the nations into the peace of God's kingdom. A picture. Recall with me, uh, if you will, for a moment, five years ago, what an exciting, amazing event happened in St. Peter's Square in Rome. It happened for the church and for the whole world. It was 2013, and it seemed the whole world converged on St. Peter's Square to join with those keeping vigil there, waiting and watching in excited anticipation for the appearance of the new Holy Father. Remember? The whole world, it seemed, was summoned there. The College of Cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church, having prayed and discerned God's will, had chosen a new Holy Father all television networks throughout the world interrupted their normal programming to go live now to Rome. People in Rome stopped and just abandoned their cars, rushing on foot to get themselves to St. Peter's. And like a flood in the Red River Valley, the square and surrounding side streets swelled with eager souls, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. As the television camera on top of St. Peter's church took it all in. One television commented, commentator noted correctly how the colonnade encircling St. Peter's Square was designed to be like a mother's arms, Holy Mother Church, holding her children in loving embrace. I was reminded of what the prophets had said. Isaiah chapter 2, in days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills. All nations shall stream towards it. Isaiah chapter 60, rise up in splendor, Jerusalem. Raise your eyes and look about. They all gather and come to you. Isaiah 49, can a mother forget her infant? Be without tenderness for her child. I will never forget you. And I was reminded of the seer, John, in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, who saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And a voice from the throne was heard, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. And a voice from the throne was heard. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will always be with them. And in the evening's darkness at St. Peter's Square, did you see the hundreds of flashes going off? People taking pictures with cameras and cell phones. Revelation chapter 20. And the holy city was radiant like a precious stone of jasper, clear as crystal, gleaming with the splendor of God. Yes, the prophets spoke of a future event put in motion by God, exceeding all human expectations, a time when God will act on the peoples of the world through the people of God, the new Israel, who in the last days will become a new society, a new Israel. The image is the new Jerusalem, 
simply Mount Zion, a city made by God come down from heaven. It will draw all nations because a fascination exceeding all others will emanate from the new Jerusalem, from the new Israel. Ultimately, it is God himself who will shine forth in the power of his actions and the peaceful quality of a new order seen in the new people of God. Now, there's a fascinating picture, excitement and joy for missionary disciples to hold on to, a picture of God's plan for the church in the new world. Let's look at the fascination and excitement and the joy of Jesus. It's there to see in the pages of the Gospels. If we close our eyes today, I think we can see it and feel it in our passage as Jesus walks along the shore, and he must have had a smile on his face as he spies Peter and Andrew casting their nets, and he calls them, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And then moving along a little bit further, he spies again James and John with their father Zebedee, and he calls them too. Come, follow me. Discipleship is fundamental for the fulfillment of the mission that Jesus has of establishing the reign of God. And so right from the outset, Jesus gathers disciples. And you know the word disciple is from the Greek, mathetes, meaning student. We might suppose that the model for Jesus' disciples would be comparable to the relationship between the rabbi and teacher to student-disciple common at the time of Jesus, huh? But it's not. Just three examples. The, rab the rab rabbinic student entered a house of study to study the law, to learn the Torah, not to follow the rabbi, there's not a single story in the rabbinic traditions in which a rabbi called a student to follow him. The student sought the teacher. But our gospel tells us not that Peter, Andrew, James, and John came to Nazareth to study Torah with Jesus, but that Jesus called them. And we don't pass over it so lightly. God, Jesus, called them seen in the immediacy of their dropping what they're doing, hearing in the voice of Jesus the will of God for them, and they responded by God's grace. He called them from their fishing to follow him. He takes the initiative against their accustomed way of life. Jesus calls his disciples to follow him, and they recognize in the stranger's voice the will of God. Two, rabbinic students served the teacher. They waited table, they cleaned the house, they washed the rabbi's feet, and so on. They served the teacher, and in that way, would learn the Torah in practice. Not so with the disciples of Jesus. The, the disciples of Jesus hear Jesus say, I come to serve, not to be served the master. They hear Jesus say, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. From Jesus, the disciples would learn the law of self-sacrificing love. Learn from Jesus the way that life in the kingdom of God looks. This is how life in God's reign looks. Jesus makes them his companions on a new path. He forms them into a new family, which is to be the seed and the sacrament of the reign of God in the world, which Jesus brings. And finally, a third difference. Most rabbis were craftsmen. Huh? Their trade paid for their established place, the home, the school. How different it was for Jesus. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus' disciples followed him from town to town, from one situation to another, from one encounter to another. It was in the day-to-day, ever-changing situation and encounters with the people that Jesus' disciples learn how life is to be in the reign of God. There was a lot to learn. 
forgive 77 times 7, Peter. That's how it is in the reign of God. Love your enemy. Turn the other cheek. That's how it is, life in the reign of God. Be perfect in it, the way your heavenly Father is. They could not live together and must not live together any other way than the way of Jesus, for the reign of God is here. So, now with, with his disciples, those first disciples in tow, Jesus embarks about, upon a fantastic, fascinating, and exciting mission, announcing the reign of God here, and joyful. Just go through the scriptures and see how Jesus fills the world with stories that have happy endings, huh? A happy ending for a leper. Sir, if you will, you can cure me. I do will it. Be cured. A happy ending for a centurion with a suffering paralyzed servant boy. Go home. It shall be done because you trusted. For a man on a mat, your sins are forgiven. Stand up, roll up your mat, and go home. For a man with a shriveled hand who came on a Sabbath, stretch out your hand, it was perfectly restored. For a woman suffering for 12 years who dared to touch his cloak, courage, daughter, your faith has restored you to health. For two blind men crying out, Son of David, have pity on us. Because your faith, because of your faith, it shall be done for you. A happy ending for a hungry crowd who had nothing to eat. Bread and fish, enough for all, with seven baskets left over. A happy ending for a widow at name, receive back your dead son. For a woman stooped, unable to stand straight, woman, you are free of your infirmity. For a shepherd with a lost sheep, for a woman who lost her coin, for a prodigal son and a loving father, let us eat, celebrate, for his son of mine is dead. He has come back to life. He was lost and he is found. Stories with happy endings. God's reign is here. Mark, in his gospel, was wonderful in conveying the excitement, joy, and Jesus in bringing the reign of God. Just for example, right away in the beginning of his gospel, he uses the one word, ethus, E-U-T-H-U-S, it means immediately, and you go through your Bible and you mark how often Mark uses this word. Chapter 1, Jesus' baptism, and immediately he comes up out of the water. Immediately the Spirit drives him into the desert. Chapter 2, a day in the life of Jesus. He calls Simon and Andrew, and immediately they leave their nets and follow him. Verse 20, he sees James and John, and immediately he calls them. Verse 28, Jesus cures a man with an unclean spirit, and immediately his fame spreads. Verse 29, immediately he leaves the synagogue, goes to the house of Simon and Andrew. Verse 30, Simon's mother-in-law is sick with a fever, and immediately they tell him of her. 31, Jesus takes her by the hand, and immediately the fever leaves her. This is exciting, what God is doing in the beginning God created the world, and God said, let there be light, and immediately there was light. In Jesus, God is acting, and immediately things are happening. The fascination and excitement and joy of Jesus. Three, Jesus' desire for us, his desire for all nations to be gathered into the kingdom of God. The time is fulfilled. The reign of God has come. God's reign is good news for the poor, liberty to captives, sight to the blind, release to prisoners, favors from the Lord. It's no longer in days to come, but now it's here, today. The promise of the prophets is fulfilled in your hearing. Today was the center of Jesus' life. Blessed are your eyes, they see what you see. Jesus knows and experiences every day how God's love is powerfully working, his goodness and his mercy so present. God has held nothing back. God has nothing more to give. God and Jesus, they're all in. The reign of God is here. The reign of God is here. And the disciples are to share in the mission of bringing the reign of God. As Matthew puts it, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and he gave them authority to expel unclean spirits, cure sick and disease of every kind. The names of the 12 apostles are these. 12, of course, is reminiscent of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And from the very first moment of his mission, Jesus strives to gather together the people of God. Even if his preaching is an appeal for personal conversion, in reality, his aim is to build the people of God whom he came to bring together, purify, and save. He came to unite the people of God and to use the people of God to unite humanity. In choosing the 12, introducing them into a communion of life with himself and involving them in the mission of proclaiming the kingdom in word and work, Jesus shows that the definitive time has arrived. The people of God, it's a universal call. They are to be his church. And after his passion and resurrection, the universal character of the apostolic mission is made explicit as Jesus sends his disciples slash apostles to the whole of creation, to all nations, and to the ends of the earth. My friends, this is the mission that continues. It is f fascinating. It is exciting. It is full of God's joy and our own. And so in our days, we seek to reflect and pray how we might be about this. How we might have that sense of being called and God's grace in us to immediately respond, to serve, not to be served, in the day-to-day -day work of God in the world, the ever-changing situation of people's lives where we're, ch where we're challenged to go, to get out and be with them, to make God's kingdom known, living in the way of the kingdom, Two, to have that fascination, excitement, and joy, and let the love of God urge us on, as St. Paul says. Three, to be fully engaged in the community that is Jesus' family, the church, building up the people of God so that the people of God may be the sacrament of God's kingdom and the instrument, the seed in the beginning of it, and the instrument for its growth in the world. And four, to live as Jesus did in today, God's today, Always knowing and experiencing each day how God's powerful love, his goodness and mercy is so present and engaging in bringing the realization of others of God's love. May the Holy Spirit inflame our hearts to be missionary disciples of Jesus. As Pope Francis has given us in the joy of the gospel, beautiful direction, his blueprint for the church in our day, we close with some thoughts from him. He says, we are seeking God's kingdom. Number 180, the kingdom already present and growing in our midst engages us at every level of our being. 181, to be evangelizers of souls. We need to develop a spiritual taste for being close to people's lives and to discover that this itself is a source of great joy. Mission, he says, is at once a passion for Jesus and a passion for people. We begin to realize that Jesus' gaze, burning with love, exp expands to embrace all people. We realize once more that he wants to make use of us to draw closer to his beloved people. He takes us from the midst of his people, and he sends us to his people. May God give us the spirit these days, we ask the intercession of Mary to watch over us.